Hey everyone, welcome to a special episode of Simplexity Quarantine Edition. It turns out I had an eerily psychic premonition when I interviewed today's guest a few weeks ago. Before this global pause ensued, brought to you by COVID-19, aka coronavirus, we delved into critical information that strikes so many humdinging chords regarding this massive pandemic, which really is a turning point to government, economies, politics, power, nations, environment, society, and life as we know it. As always, our guests help simplify the complexities of life and bring curiosity and contemplation to meaningful, sometimes difficult conversations. Today and part two next week are definitely valuable in your pursuit of self-education, inquiry, and preparation for the coming days. We spend the first couple minutes defining foundational concepts and then it ramps up into some really juicy information, like discussing China discussing how nations gradually change their own history books and what democracy looks like in the future. Again, all without knowing what was about to happen. A brief side note, for those feeling stressed and anxious or confused and restless, I'm also currently leading 14 days of mindfulness on Instagram Live and YouTube Live daily, which includes mental health check-ins, guided meditations, and mindful movement. I intend to create more of these at-home programs and services in the coming weeks on my website, YouTube, and beyond. Right now, we have 30,000 of us who have joined worldwide, and we're growing daily, so please come as you are and tell your friends and family. The uh, timing and info is on my Instagram at Allison Stoner. All right, today, do take notes. Do get the message of simplexity out there. This podcast will continue to offer a lot of timely value in the coming weeks, guaranteed. I'm teeing up lots of guests here to serve you and the collective. So stay healthy and stay home, friends. Without further ado, please enjoy part one of this special episode with PJ Thumb. Hey everyone, welcome to Simplexity, where we simplify the complexities of life and bring a little curiosity and contemplation to meaningful and sometimes difficult conversations. I'm your host, Alice. What is the glue that holds humans together, underpinning every exchange, whether speech, writing, or a financial transaction? What separates humans from other animals? Story. Narratives are essential to every society, the currency of life, states essayist Adam Gopnik, further presenting that everything, faith, science, love, needs a story for people to find it plausible. No story, no sale. We generally submit that other animals communicate to describe their reality to each other, whereas we humans employ our system of communication to create entirely new realities. And oh, how far our collective imagination will go. As evolution and history indicate, humans use two tactics, fiction and cooperation, to accomplish just about any end and justify any mean. Example, we made up money. But it's hard to be objective in the documentation and dispersal of all that has happened and will occur. What details are kept? What's removed? What's misreported? How do you power and control mold these myths? How could a singular and linear point of view, narrow by default, be reliably entrusted to explain the multitudinous nature of our existence? And yet... Our textbooks that we use to educate generation after generation, our national rhetoric, our media, take on a certain version of events, often drenched in the dominant ideology of our particular civilization, to maintain the state of affairs and, yes, order. These days, spin, alternative facts, and fake news have replaced actual facts. There go our imaginations again. Emotions take precedence over evidence, and I don't know about you, but my yearning for accuracy is greater than ever. Life is a whole lot of he said, she said, they said, and if history has been composed by the victors, I'd rather a tale that reflects all civilians' experiences. 
We all share this planet, and everybody knows something that you don't and could learn if you just listen. Nonetheless, writer Sabrina Tavernes makes a great point. Our selective memory is a global phenomenon, and yes, that's dangerous and confining. We could argue that through the device of storytelling, all of us are living in some measurement of fantasy, escapism, or multiplicity right now, denying certain realities and concocting our own. But unlike a Netflix series whose season finale you dislike so you take to Twitter to write your own alternate ending, you can tweet and complain about current events all you want, but you can't stop all the world events from happening. And someone or some machine somewhere is dictating it for our great, 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 great offspring to understand in the future. How will we remember 2020? That leads us to what we'll be chatting about today with our guest. PJ Thum and his colleagues at New Narrative, a Southeast Asian platform for journalism, research, art, and community organization, believe that knowing and robustly debating how we live with myths will help us to better understand our country and to imagine its future, which in their case means Singapore. PJ himself is a Singaporean historian and research fellow at Oxford. He's also a former national swimmer, the first Singaporean to swim the English Channel, and he competed in four swim races in the 1996 Olympics. Today, he is our personal guide through dubious waters of identifying myths, spotting and combating fake news, facing threats and consequences when we ruffle feathers, understanding how historical trends have shaped all our lives, and peering into democratic activism, which fights for every person to have a stake in their own country in order to truly practice democracy. PJ, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, Thank you for having me, Alison. I've got to say, I've been listening to your podcast, The History of Singapore, and I've read through your books, Living with Myths in Singapore, and The First Year by the contributors within New Narrative. Your dedication to truth and fairness, even when it puts your life and livelihood at risk, is irrefutably honorable. So thank you for what you do. And learning about Singapore has opened my eyes to what's happening on the other side of the world, as well as in the U.S. And the first thing that caught my attention was your explanation of national identities and nationalism. So let's start there. What is a national identity and who forms them and how? Uh, well, first, uh, thanks, Alison. You're, you're very kind and thank you for that really kind introduction. National identity, uh, nationalism, those are very um, complicated concepts in some way and, and also really deceptively simple. Uh, the, the fundamental thing about nationalism um, is about identification with a broader group. Benedict Anderson talked about nationalism as an imagined political community, imagined as both inherently limited and sovereign and when he says imagined, it means like most people in a nation will never meet each other. You know, as an American, you probably won't meet more than, I don't know, 1% of the people in America. And yet all of you share this self-consciousness. You imagine that you are horizontally comrades of a, of a unit. Hmm. Um, in, in some ways, it's been argued that, you know, we think of nationalism as the reflection of a nation, the awakening of a nation to self-consciousness. But it's equally, if not more, the other way a political unit forms and it needs a common identity and then forms a nationalism to fit that identity, to fit the political unit. Hmm. So national identity come, is kind of derived from the need of a unit to justify its existence and to bring all the people in that unit onto a sort of common shared identity, right? But the interesting thing about nationalism, it's, it's limited Right, because all nationalism has boundaries. Of all the isms, it's it has no claim to universality. Right, if you think about all the other isms that we have in this world, socialism, you know, being very popular in your current political debate, it's a universal mm. assertion. But nationalism is by definition limited, and mm. it's it's imagined as a sovereign concept because the concept was born in in an age, sort of in a response to the decline of the legitimacy of the divinely ordained monarch, the hierarchical Mm. 
dynastic realm, right? And in a world where you're moving to equality, where people matter rather than who God has chosen to lead you, well, how do you justify this group? Nationalism is a response to human needs in some way. It's it's a response to neuroses, you know, in some ways that we need to categorize people and we need to belong to a group and we need to belong to each other. But nationalism, it's fundamentally really empty in some ways, right? Because it's so modern and imagined, and yet people assume or they think of nationalism as this really deep-rooted, has a very subjective antiquity, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's universal because everyone believes you have a nation, same as, say, you have a, a gender, right? You have a gender, you must also have a nation, but if you think about it, what is a nation? You know, if the whole concept disappeared, how would our lives really drastically change, mm-hmm. if at all? And it has a huge amount of political power without anyone actually being able to define it clearly. And with, you know, there's no great nationalist thinker in terms of the ideology itself. Nationalism right. has no Hobbes, no Marx, no Verber, no Tocqueville, right? Mm-hmm. So it's it's strangely a really empty sort of concept that has so much power because we believe in it, because we need it in a way. That's kind of where nationalism comes from. That's so helpful. And what are the purposes and functions? Like, where do we see national identity being employed? Because I can tell that, you know, if we have an imaginary boundary and we see someone on the other side, well, we can band together and try and take down the guy because he looks like he's on the other side and that's the wrong side and we're right. What are some devices that national identity, you know, is used for? Well, there are several kinds of national identity. So are we talking about a sort of group solidarity between people? I suppose that's the kind of answer to your question that national identity, it helps us build solidarity, build identification with each other. Um, It helps us create solidarity. But national identity is also, as I mentioned, employed by governments to justify the boundaries of the state, to bring people together, to motivate them towards shared goals. But also, as we've seen throughout recent history, and when I, by recent I mean two, three hundred years, the uh, use of national identity is to define a certain group as being in power, as being in control of that nation, the nation state, and to exclude people who either threaten elites or threaten the people who control that identity, threaten the in-group. So the, the crucial thing to remember, I think, is that nationalism is both inclusive and exclusive because you can't have a national identity, a nationalism, without also being able to say who isn't part of that identity. Mm-hmm. And that's the the powerful thing and the dangerous thing, the great thing, the liberating thing, right? It enabled a lot of liberation movements, but it also enables a lot of oppression. And so national identity is about boundaries. What would you say are the genuine, core, organic values of Singaporean identity. I'm guessing there's sort of what's happening on the ground. There's also the narrative that the government maybe wants to project, or maybe they're congruent. But what would you say um, if people want to get a sense of what Singapore values in their identity? Again, right, it's very hard to define it because, you know, all reality is subjective by definition. And so with our yearning for accuracy, for truth, we also need to recognize that There is no absolute truth and facts can exist but be interpreted drastically differently from people on different sides. And national identity is like that. So you talk about, use the word genuine, core, organic. Those are actually very different things because a genuine identity could still be very different for every single person in Singapore. Mm. Uh, A core identity, on the other hand, suggests that there are a certain set of values which are central to that identity. But would you be able to get everyone to agree on what those values are? Only if you empty them of of meaning. You know, we we all agree democracy is good, right? Okay, not all, but let's say 80% of people, a lot of people agree democracy is good. But if you start to break down the concept of democracy, then people really, you know, they, they argue... And there's a lot of contention about what exactly democracy is, right? Mm -hmm. So you have very abstract concepts. 
And then organic, and I think that's the most important, is what evolves over time to become that identity and from a sort of bottom-up approach as opposed to, say, a government imposing an identity upon a group of people and saying, everyone with this is part of the group and you have to conform and if you don't, you're not part of the group. So your question is kind of has certain assumptions which are very heavily loaded towards a certain idea of national identity as being possibly definable, essential, evolving, but something that can exist Fundamentally, national identity only exists as long as we believe it exists. It's mm. imagined, right? And it, what that imagination is could be anything as long as we all imagine it together. <laughs> that's the, that's, that's the, the crazy thing about it. It doesn't really matter what we exist. It matters more that we, um, we all that share that exists. same belief and that is what the national identity then becomes based on you know, and then you say, "Oh, that's that's what we've always believed, or whatever." But no, you know, like the national identities of virtually every country, the the sort of things that people believe as culturally specific or special to them, are historically, temporally, extremely recent. Hmm. Um, the things that we eat or drink, or the things that we enjoy, the things we read, the concepts that we share, the values are historically all very, very recent things. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's part of this imagination that it's connected to a great sort of deep historical past that also helps sustain it when actually in almost every case it's it's not true. Sorry, I didn't really answer your question. I kind of deconstructed your question. And that's perfectly fine and, and very helpful because it helps us across the board no matter who's listening and from where. So if I'm able to summarize somewhat, uh, governments help perpetuate the myth that the borders are natural, logical, and represent this unique nation that the the nation overlaps perfectly with state and equally that national identity has something timeless and inherent about it. And there are many reasons that governments would want to keep up this myth. When it comes to Singapore and the historical influences and, and trends and leadership, can you speak to any specific myths of Singaporean heritage or uh, culture wars that characterize day-to-day -day life right now in Singapore? One of the things that our government um, loves to or has really pushed since the 1980s is a deep sense of vulnerability and insecurity as mm -hmm. part of our national identity stemming from both our geographic position but also Singapore's historic status as a an immigrant state, an immigrant nation, you might say, mm -hmm. where the vast majority of the population has ancestors who came from somewhere else in the colonial, the British colonial period. Mm -hmm. And then this deep sense of insecurity is something that the government has then manipulated to, you know, for its own benefit, to keep people insecure and running into the hands of the, the arms of the government to save them. And that allows the government to then justify all sorts of authoritarianism. Hmm. And what a lot of people push back on, including myself, is this idea of insecurity and this, this constant fear that the government tries to uh, imbue in us because it is ahistorical and inaccurate. So I've kept this kind of abstract because you can see how that applies to the US or to you know, virtually every country with an authoritarian government because they, part of the culture war is this idea of fear and that the national identity is under threat mm -hmm. and that is then manipulated by governments. So, of course, in Singapore specifically, because we became independent during the Cold War, the government uses uh, concepts like communism, Right as a, as an as an enemy, and today it talks about Islamic extremism and the fragility of our racial harmony. Um, the idea of Singaporean identity being a very multi ethnic one, but also a very you know one that is is constantly under threat. That Singaporeans are people who never take things for granted, who are always fighting and scrapping, and who are insecure in that sense 
right? In hmm. both a good sense and a bad sense. So you can see the abstract and the concrete there. It sounds like we would ideally want, well, <laughs> I, I can only speak for myself here. I would ideally want my government to not erase or suppress different people's experiences, especially those in marginalized groups and minorities, and I wouldn't want them to feel weak or powerless. Instead, I would want to build a new civic identity out of the diversity of the nation. But also, I I want to speak to the British influence. Would you say that Singapore currently wants to maintain the products of colonialism that, you know, since it was constructed out of the compromises of decolonization. Where are we at with with what the Brits have done to Singapore? And how do the people feel about it? Uh, that, that's the curious thing about Singapore. We're one of very few post-colonial states which celebrate our colonization and celebrate what the, the British colonizers did. And so because our government was handed power on a plate by the British... And not just that, the colluded with the British to remove their political enemies of the time. They then project a continuity from the British period and then the post-colonial period and continue to emphasize certain myths about how the British brought civilization, basically. They brought prosperity, they brought development, they brought meritocracy. Hmm. You know, they brought progressive Western values, uh, liberal free trade sort of values, but they also then emphasize, right, the reason why those succeeded, like why we are prosperous and economically successful is because, well, you have a colonial power which was authoritarian, which ruled uh, as a colonizer, and so the post-colonial government, it then is able to justify its own authoritarianism partly through that lens by saying, Mm. look, you know, this is how Singapore is. So then to come go back to your earlier question, it then argues that, well, Singaporeans, our culture is that we don't want freedom. We want prosperity. We Mm. are willing to accept authoritarianism in exchange for prosperity. But of course, if you actually look at Singapore history, all of this is uh, highly dubious. It's, It's a very one-sided perspective. It's an elite perspective on Singapore history, right? Because Mm. creating a free trade port required dispossessing indigenous natives. It required impoverishing people who were already traders, uh, in particular traders indigenous to Southeast Asia, the Malays, the Bugis, in favor of other traders who were allies of the British. It required the destruction of certain ways of life. It required Mm. the forced integration of people into wage labor, um, which has, you know, in this very neoliberal economic age, we, we understand that it actually is a very dehumanizing thing when it is not accompanied by protections, by regulation, by human rights, labor rights. So the, this sort of myths that, that you're, you're talking about are employed by the Singapore government then to justify its policies today. And so its reading of Singapore history then is also very much in line with you know, that justification. And one of the things I, I always point out, of course, is that as its policies, the current government's policies changed over the decades, and we've had the same government since 1959, same government, highly repressive, but they've told very different versions of history based on the kind of policies they need to justify. Mm. And because they have such authoritarian control, they're simply able to to change the history that we tell a bit by bit every year as their policies change, the history that we learn in school changes to suit that policy to the point where wow. uh, the history that they told in 90, 1997 is drastically different from the history they were telling in 84, which is drastically different from the history they were telling in 68. But we don't realize it because it's a slow adjustment over time to suit each government. That's why historians are important, right? You know, and freedom of information, freedom of expression, which we don't have in Singapore. So it's impossible to contradict the government's version of history. And you've come up against directly the myths and narratives and you've challenged them because of information you uncovered. And we'll definitely speak more to that. I do want to talk a little bit more about identity first. We've We've covered just the the basics on national identity and nation state 
identity. Let's break this down to the individual level. Uh, when we're just generally talking about identity, you know, there's race, there's socioeconomic status. There, there are so many factors. First, let's, I guess, define some of those. What factors make up our identity? And then second, is what we believe about ourselves also the way we're perceived by our government and society? I mean, I think you can have as many factors as different people. Uh, there's a lot of different factors, right? I, I think language actually is really, really important. It's one of the historical markers of identity. Mm. Uh, it's one of the historical turning points, especially religious language, say, uh, shifted from sacred to secular, and language became democratized through the printing press. And then, of course, you have things like the sort of your, your self-identification of race, of ethnicity, of culture, Right. Age is, is a part of identity. Gender, we talked about gender. And religion, I think, is another really important one. How you see the world and your interpretation of the world, because religion and, you know, and culture affects your conception of, say, time, your conception of socioeconomic relationships, your mm -hmm. conception of individuals, right? And, of course, the influence of the Enlightenment and Reformation, These have major influences on how we perceive society and in how we perceive society that affects how we as a person identify ourselves within it. So there's a lot of different things which affect your identity. Too. I'm thinking specifically about some um, things that I was reading and, and seeing you speak to in terms of what box you check on a census or on certain paperwork from the government when you say you're one thing but the government says you're something else and those identities aren't talking to each other. They're not consistent. And how is it okay for governments to get away with that? Why are we using those markers if they're not accurate? Well, I mean, you think about it from a, a government's point of view, right? It has to govern a territory with a very diverse population. And every population is very diverse. You know, no matter how homogenous, no matter how small, there's going to be people who disagree, right? So when a state reaches a certain point, you need a bureaucracy, you need a civil service. How is that civil service going to govern? And if you're going to start from a point where, okay, every individual is unique and we need to administer everyone as unique, well, that's great, but it is going to be really, really difficult. So what do governments do? They start putting people into boxes where they feel that if we treat everyone in that box the same way, it's going to be okay, right? It's, there's this sort of a, a general agreement of those people in that box. So mm -hmm. if you say everyone who's Christian should be treated a certain way, or if you say everyone of a certain race should be treated a certain way, at some level, you'll find people will agree. Uh, yeah, there's certain commonalities there. Everyone who speaks a certain language, well, we should then as a government speak to them in that language because it's their language and so we treat them a certain way. So it makes things really much simpler for a government if it can put you into boxes. The danger is when the government either starts treating certain boxes better than other boxes mm -hmm. or it starts saying, well, you know what, it would be far simpler if there are only four boxes, everyone's got to get into one of those boxes mm -hmm. or you're not going to be recognized by the government. And so that forces a lot of people into boxes that they don't want to fit into. But mm -hmm. for a government, which is all powerful, often that government doesn't even realize. You know, I, I like to believe people are well-intentioned, but it's very easy for the government to say, okay, there are 12 races in this country and you're one of them and we're going to treat you according to whichever box you're in. Well, you know, what if you're not, right? What if you're a product of intermarriage of some kind? What, right. what if you don't have a race? What if you are part of a race, but you're an edge case? Where do you fit in? Yeah. Human beings with our myriad complexities, identities, don't fit into boxes easily, but bureaucracies want, even need boxes in order to function effectively. And that is a, a huge tension. And of course, governments have the power to then knowingly or unknowingly abuse it to force us to be things we don't want to be. It seems like that flows a little bit into identity politics. Uh, what, what is identity politics anyway? And where did this first originate? Hmm, I'm not sure if I can answer the second half of that question because to me, 
that's been around as long as human history has been around. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the oldest history that I've studied is Roman history. And definitely, there were huge identity politics going on. You know, the whole concept of being Roman and asserting that as superior to not being Roman. And this whole idea of, you know, us Romans are civilized. And it's the same with China, right? Chinese in the Warring States period, Confucius before, you know, about 200, 150 BCE, their, their conception was that they are civilized and therefore superior and that allowed them to create an in-group and an out-group, an elite group and a non-elite group. You know, the definition of civilization then allows them to say, okay, this our identity are these markers, right? You know the Confucian classics. You mm. know the Latin poems. And that then allows you to use that those definitions in ways which then you can use in politics to assert privileges for a specific group, assert that a certain group should be privileged above others, or assert that a certain group should be oppressed, right? Because they don't identify with that. You know, this group are slaves because look at them, they come from this region which is not part of Rome and because they are barbarians who don't know the classics, you know? Hmm. You know, the interesting thing about China, China, its name in Chinese means the Middle Kingdom or the Central Kingdom. And that was actually the core of the Chinese identity. Even though today we think of Chinese as a certain you know, very powerful set of linguistic, social, cultural, racial characteristics, the fact that they called themselves the central kingdom was all about their idea of the universe and their place within it. They're mm -hmm. at the center, they're at the peak, they're the most important, they're elite, they're civilized, they're militarily, economically the most powerful, right? And that's part of the identity of the people that today we call Chinese, the, the quote-unquote Chinese civilization. Mm -hmm. Right, So identity politics, uh, once you define certain things, certain ways, whether it's national identity, whether it's elite identity, whether it's what is meritocracy, right? what is meritorious, then that means that you can use that identity to create in-groups and out-groups to justify divisions of resources. Politics mm -hmm. is fundamentally how do we divide scarce resources among a large group of people? How do we choose, make decisions when there's a lot of people who do we benefit? What do we prioritize? And identity politics gives you a certain set of criteria that you can then use for good or bad and to manipulate to affect the outcomes of those political decisions. So that can speak to social issues like same-sex marriage, police shootings of unarmed black men, the fluidity of gender, campus battles about safe spaces and trigger warnings. These are typically the kinds of issues, you know, people are referring to when they're talking about identity politics and where, where you stand versus where I stand. Now that we have a more thorough understanding of our multi-layered identities, in your opinion, where should we go from here if we're wanting to practice democracy? As in, what trends Whoa, and movements... big question. I know. What trends and movements have <laughs> gotten us where we are, and what do you foresee being our greatest hurdles or turning points ahead? You know, the funny thing about being a historian is people always ask me two kinds of questions which historians, most historians, can't really answer. One is counterfactuals. What if this had happened or not happened? And the other is, what's going to happen in the future? Or <laughs> how do we change the future? What we do is we interpret the past and we tell you what happened in the past and you learn from that. So with that caveat, right, I think if we want to practice democracy and democracy, we have to think about all the different definitions of democracy and what it means for, you know, for the people, the demos, to rule and the forms, the structures that democracy takes on. Right, America is structured as a republic. Is that necessarily the best way? So I and I think when we come specifically to the issue of identity, the I think what we need to strive for is an identity that is as broad based and inclusive and as tolerant as possible and one that enables people to gain a certain sense of fitting in and a certain sense of security in belonging. And even if they don't belong, 
they should have a certain sense of security that they they would be accepted. So I think in terms of identity, in some ways, it's a bit of a contradiction, right? We need to devalue the the centrality of identity to how we sort of define our democracies by making I, the protection of all identities more important, mm-hmm. even identities which you disagree with. Because I think to come back to identity politics and the kind of divisions you're talking about, so much of it is driven by fear. So to decrease fear and mm. increase security and make people feel like they're okay and will be and their way of life is is accepted and tolerated as long as of course they don't hurt anyone else but the easy way of course for politicians to manipulate and gain the vote is to is through fear and we mm. see that i i mean i don't need to explain that to you your audience i think you you see that a lot <laughs> we see that everywhere now yeah. and the politics of fear is very strong but these are very short term sort of gains and the problem is they work in the short term but in the long run the only way to successfully build harmonious societies where people work together is i think we need to focus on removing fear and making people feel like they will be welcome no matter what yeah i agree and there's so much more ground to cover i will put a pause on this part now and i'm gonna throw to a quick commercial but next week on the second part we can dive into more of your personal experience with uncovering and publicly challenging the narratives driving Singapore, as well as how we as readers and citizens can research information and figure out who's telling the truth. And uh, I also want to highlight some of the compelling stories that the new narrative has covered in the first year. Uh, so we'll, we'll take a quick break now, and then when we come back, we'll do our round of weekly affirmations as normal just after this. Welcome back. It's time for our weekly affirmations. So listen to each twice and then repeat in the space for the third. Here we go. First, I recognize history as a narrative in flux that evolves with the plurality of views. I recognize history as a narrative in flux that evolves with a plurality of views. Second, I differentiate the tactics of fear from ones that offer hope that are used by the authority. I differentiate the tactics of fear from ones that offer hope that are used by the authority. And lastly, I vet multiple sources of information to form a more inclusive opinion. I vet multiple sources of information to form a more inclusive opinion. Wonderful. Thank you for listening and supporting. Today, if you find it in your means to do so, please consider taking a look at what PJ and his network are offering the world and go to new narrative with an F dot com and support with a monetary donation or share the content and material. We will leave the links in the description for easy access. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week for more Simplexity. It's anything but small talk. Peace.